Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to rainy, which is appreciated by my lawn and bushes, cloudy, but fun-filled afternoon of organic chemistry, Chem 170 with your host, me, Dr. White. All right, important announcements. One, uh, later today, sometime this afternoon, I will put in the assignment area, test number one, PDF file that will be password protected. Either today or tomorrow morning, I recommend that you download it. You can't open it up because you don't have the password. Tomorrow, you'll be taking test number one. When? After our lecture. And I will email you right after our lecture tomorrow, test number one password. You should all be checking your email, student email. Once you get it, you have until, I think I have it down for 10 o'clock and I might change it even to 11, but you have till sometime Friday morning to take the test and upload your answers to the assignment area like you've been doing labs. Please make it as a single PDF file and upload it. Now, if you don't have a printer, then what I'd recommend you do is just write out the answers. You don't have to write the questions out on a piece of paper. And then either with your scanner or a cell phone, take pictures and make a PDF file. I've put files how to do that. And I'll do that in the assignment area for test number one. And then what I will do is uh, you'll see, and I've already talked about test number one. It's in the announcement, what it covers, which will be Al can well, hold on. Dr. White's getting lazy. I shouldn't be lazy for my students. Oh, by the way, if you've never read, if you're not following Paul Krugman in the New York Times and his Twitter, you should be. I've been following him for at least more than 10 years. He's a Nobel winning economist and a great pundit. And when he's wrong, he, he says I've been wrong. Most of the time he's never, he's not wrong. But anyways, back to this class. If you see here, it's still up there and it will be for a while. I think I have it go away on Saturday, but test number one, and it will cover hydrocarbons, alkanes, cycloalkanes, alkenes, alkynes, aromatic compounds. Again, this is not an open notes or open internet test. I will have things in my test that I've developed since we've been on Zoom that will let me know if you've done that. And it's quite effective, unfortunately. I don't like catching students cheating. It does make me happy, but please don't. Now, test number one, we'll have 13 points, general knowledge, you know, things that we've talked about that you should know, like how many bonds to carbon, hopefully you all figured out that's for, and other things, I don't know if I'll ask that, but you understand, like given a use of uh, alkane or other things like that, the nomenclature will be 45 points because we spent a lot of time on nomenclature. We're doing less for test two and that will be lower. But to start out, you learn things like how many carbons in the longest chain, how to name them, the alkyl groups and so on. And there are two types of nomenclature question. One is here's a, a molecule, give the IUPAC, which means official name for that molecule. The other type of nomenclature question is, here's the name, draw the structure. And finally, there's gonna be 47 points of reactions and all but one question will be give the product or products for the following reaction. The one that's gonna be slightly different, I call synthesis and there'll only be one on test one. That is give the starting materials for the following reaction. And that's test number one. And like I said, Thursday after our regular Zoom meeting, which I may end early, I will send out the password 
and well, you'll do the take the test. All right. Before I move on, any questions? I guess not, so I better get going and move on. Now, yesterday we were talking about my favorite area of organic chemistry, one of them. There's another area we'll get to later in the semester. That's been nice to me too. It helped pay for my mortgage and a couple of cars and so other things, but ketones and aldehydes have done that too. And let's talk about ketones and aldehydes. Now, what is an aldehyde? Just a little review. Remember, this is for test number two, but for now, let's do aldehyde. And an aldehyde is carbon double bond to oxygen. Remember, that's the carbonyl with a hydrogen in our group. And a ketone is a carbon double bond to oxygen with two R groups on it. And they can be the same or different. And that's a ketone. Remember, aldehyde we talked about yesterday. You find the longest chain with the carbonyl carbon. That's the Carbonyl carbon is carbon double bond to oxygen, which is part of the carbonyl group, which in my mind is the most important group. It's not a functional group, but it's still called a group in all of organic chemistry. And as I said yesterday, if somebody asks me, what kind of organic chemist are you? The only answer I can give is I'm a carbonyl synthetic organic chemist. And you find the longest chain with the carbonyl carbon, name it as an alkane, drop the E at the end and add a L. No number because the carbonyl carbon is always number one. For a ketone, same thing. Find the longest chain or now ring. Aldehydes can't be in rings. Ketones can. So you can have cyclic or acyclic. And for what you do, Name the alkane or cycloalkane, drop the E, and replace it with O and E. Oddly, I've never said the word one to replace it. I always say spell it out. Well, I guess that's one of my Freudian things. But for acyclic ketones, you need a number, which carbon is the carbonyl carbon for cyclic, no number, because carbonyl carbon rocks and in the ring, the carbonyl carbon is always number one. And you everybody knows that, so you don't put a number. So let's have a little fun, quick review we just did. And why don't you give the IUPAC name for the following molecule? Three points each. And when you're done, give me a thumbs up or some other designation, you're done.
And good news, I don't charge extra for border collies. All right, everybody done? I think so. When you look at a molecule, you look for what's different. Ooh, what's not carbon, carbon, single bond, or carbon or hydrogen atom, oxygen, double bond to carbon. With a hydrogen and carbons, this is an aldehyde. And how do you do this? Find the longest chain with the carbonyl carbon. One, two, three, four. You could have also said that four and you get the same name. And that's butane. It's an aldehyde, drop the E, add AL. As soon as I say butanol, you need no number. That's spoken for. Oh, it's your old friend, two of them. Two methyl groups. Remember, di is two, tri is three. You don't need a number in front of the right here because everybody knows this is number one. And therefore, dimethyl means I need two numbers, and that's 2,3-dimethyl butanol. Butanol, not all. That would be an alcohol. And let's do one more. And what would be the IUPAC name uh, for that? And don't forget to give me the thumbs up when you're done or give me that look like get to work, Dr. White. Oh, I'm getting that look Get to work, Dr. White, so I better get to work. All right, what's different? What's not a carbon-carbon single bond or carbon or hydrogen? Oh, oxygen. And it's double bond to this carbon in a ring. And if you look at the carbons in the ring, they're connected together. So this is a ketone. Find the longest chain. Oh, no, find the ring. Five carbons. Pentane, it's a ring. Don't forget the word cyclo. Pentane. It's a ketone. So I drop the E at the end of cyclopentane. Put O-N-E. And we have, oh, look, an isopropyl group. And what carbon? This is one. You go to direction. To give the alkyl groups the lowest number, and that would be three isopropyl. If I can spell it. Three isopropyl cyclopentanone. There's no number here for where, because everybody knows that's always one, and it is, even if there are other functional groups. All right. Oh, let's do one where you have a name and draw the structure. And why don't you draw the structure of 3-ethyl-2-decanone? And don't forget, there are four bonds to carbon. Yes, four bonds to carbon.
Eh, it looks like just about everybody's done. Let me check the rest of the class. I think everybody's done, so I better get to work. How do you decode any organic name to know what to draw? You start from the right and move left. O-N-E-N-D, -E ketone. If this were E, decane, 10 carbons. And one more makes 10. Now, you can start numbering the chain from either side. I like doing it this way. And good habits, Dr. White, doesn't change. And this, too, tells you the carbonyl. Carbon is carbon number two. And then on carbon three, which would be this one, I have an ethyl group. And now I have to get to work. putting in my hydrogens. And I'm done. And that's 10 carbons, one through 10. That would be decanone. And it's on carbon two, two decanone, ethyl group on three, three ethyl, two decanone. All right, now, as we saw in alcohols, we're getting to functional groups that have not only IUPAC names, but common names, which are used every day in our life. So let's, I'm only going to ask you to learn two common names. By the way, um, for all the aldehydes and ketones I've talked about, or a lot of the smaller ones, they're common names. And example, butanal is called butyral aldehyde but I'm not going to ask you to learn that. Uh, two butanone is also known as methyl ethyl ketone, which you can go and buy at Home Depot. It's a good solvent and things like that. But let's look at some important, two of them, common names. And those common names are formaldehyde and acetone. Now, on common names, I'll never ask you, here's the structure, what's the common name? But I can give you on a test, here's the common name, draw the structure. Formaldehyde has this structure. And at first glance, you say, well, hey, aldehydes has a carbonyl hydrogen and an R group. And you said R groups have carbon and hydrogen. Well, this R group has a hydrogen. Well, it turns out formaldehyde undergoes most of the same chemistry as other aldehydes, and therefore that's why it's called an aldehyde. And I'm going to talk more about, about formaldehyde in a little while. Now, the simplest ketone, acetone, nobody ever calls this 2-propanone. It's acetone. Here's the structure. It's the simplest ketone. And sometimes I'll draw it this way too. And this is acetone. Now, if we had been working in the lab, you would learn that organic chemists use acetone to clean glassware. It helps dry it out and also take out a lot of chemical gunk in your with it professional word, gonk, uh, in your glassware. In fact, when I was in grad school, I was doing so many reactions and using so much acetone, I could go through a half a gallon to a gallon in a day sometimes. The other use of acetone is it's one of the two compounds that's nail polish remover. If you go to a big box store and look at the shelves where they have the bottles of nail polish remover, and if you pick up one of the bottles, you'll find one group, the main ingredient is acetone. 
and they put in a little uh, perfume too to make it smell nicer. But acetone is one, I'll teach you the other one. Uh, later on, the other type of molecule that's used for nail polish remover. As you can see, I forgot to polish my nails today, shucks. But anyways, uh, it will remove the polish from your nails. And it does that because it dissolves it. Now, let's talk more about formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is a very useful compound but at the same time, it's a very dangerous hazardous compound. And it's used to make many things. And now I need to tell about it's sort of a sad story, true story about formaldehyde. Uh, back in 2000, I think six or seven, let me look it up while you're here. Back in 2005, I was off by a year. We had in the United States, in the Gulf area around New Orleans and those states, Hurricane Katrina. I don't know how many of you remember that. Well, anyways, Hurricane Katrina did serious damage, and including flooding and destroying a lot of homes people lived in. And at that time, we were under President Bush, the second one, and he had unfortunately put in a guy named Brown who was previously did something with uh, show horses. Yeah, right, qualified. But he was in charge of FEMA. And they had to get a lot of uh, homes built. So they contracted companies in the United States to build mobile homes. Well, within a year or so, People in those homes were getting very sick. And I read about a very brave woman who on her own was a member of the Sierra Club, took it upon herself to find out what's going on here. And that woman's name is Becky Gillette. And when I read about Becky Gillette, and you know, something I've never asked her, I haven't talked to her in a couple of years, but she found out that the problem was formaldehyde, free formaldehyde, formaldehyde vapors in those trailers. And she found a company that could analyze that for her inexpensively. And they found out the level of formaldehyde was way too high. Formaldehyde is a hazardous chemical and there's an OSHA limit, Occupational Safety Hazard Authorization Act, uh, it's what OSHA stands for, something somewhere very close, that limits the amount of worker exposure in the workplace over a certain period of time. And in those trailers, it was way, way much higher than that. That's why people were getting sick. Well, first Bush and Brown tried to discredit Becky and say, your numbers are garbage. And they had the EPA tested, they did it in the winter when the colder weather would bring the levels down. And lo and behold, the EPA still found it was quite high. And Becky Gillette helped uh, lead the charge or the fight against Bush. And then when Obama came in to get laws changed to protect people from formaldehyde. Now, I'd heard on a news show or I read on the internet on, I read things like Huffington Post, the New York Times and Washington uh, uh, Post or Washington Times, I forgot which, every morning I'm a speed reader. I can read about 100, 150 pages an hour. So I read all, I'm a news junkie in the morning with my cup of tea. And I thought, oh, I got to call her because Dr. White is an expert in formaldehyde. I work for Borden Chemical, now Hexion, that was one of the largest, the company that was the largest producer of formaldehyde in the United States, not the world. This is back then. I don't know about now. I'm sure they're still up at the top. And we used a lot of that internally. My last patent allowed my knowledge of formaldehyde and another chemical to make a product 
that was more environmentally friendly to be used in foundries to hold the sand together to make the molds. But I had long left at this point, I was teaching and I was consulting, I wasn't with Borden anymore. So I called Becky. I said, I know formaldehyde, any way you can use me, I'll help you free. Because that's what I thought would be the right thing to do. And I helped her. And one of the things I found out was that these trailers were high in formaldehyde. Why? Formaldehyde reacts with phenol to make a resin. And this won't be on the test, but it's an important thing I should talk about that you should learn about. And a resin is just a fancy name for glue, a specialized glue. And if you look at how is plywood made, how is oriented strand board made, how is particle board made, they use a phenolic resin, that kind of glue, to hold those sheets in case of plywood together. Now, when you make that resin, to make it stronger, you make sure there's enough bonds between the formaldehyde and the phenol. And generally you use excess formaldehyde that's left in the product. No, you spend extra time and money to react the unreacted formaldehyde. So it's no longer escaping from that glue, which then would escape from the uh, plywood or whatever, you know, plywood mainly to make trailers. And in the United States, because of safety, OSHA safety standards, any resin producer has to be below a certain level. I think it used to be 100 ppm parts per million. Now it's, I think, lower. Well, because of Katrina and all the shortage of plywood, these companies, and this is my conjecture, but I, I would bet on it, and I'm only, I'll say I bet on it when I know I'd win, they went to China and got extra plywood. On China, they had no ocean or anything, and those had a lot of free formaldehyde in it. And I'll explain why I think I know I'm right. And that was what was making people sick. Now, one of the things Becky asked me after I'd been working for her for a while, uh, then Congressman Waxman and Select Committee of Congress was going to have a show hearing and I found out it was just for show, but to get the owners of the trailer companies that made these bad FEMA trailers, they made something like, I don't know how many tens of thousands they had already made. They were getting people sick in for a hearing in front of TV cameras. And Becky had been talking with them. I think she might even, I don't know if she at that or not later date, she actually appeared before our select committee or committee in Congress but she said, could you call this gentleman? Uh, he'd like to talk to you. And I said, who is he? He's the lead investigator for Waxman, Representative Waxman on that committee. So I said, sure. And I called him up and he started asking me things. And I started talking because he wasn't a chemist about dangers of formaldehyde and things like that. And after about 45, 50 minutes, he thanked me. And I said, can I ask you a favor to do? He said, what? I said, could you ask Congressman Waxman to ask the owners of the trailer companies where they bought their wood? Simple question. Immediately said, I can't. Immediately, I know it was just a show thing they were doing. Uh, for those of you who know the term PYA, that's what Waxman, those people were doing. Look what we're doing. And I was sort of disgust disgusted, really, but I didn't say anything to the gentleman. And uh, they didn't ask that question. The fact that he said no so immediately, he knew the formaldehyde came from the wood that came from China. And that's true. Now, what I did do was around that time or a little afterward, California enacted what's called the CARB laws for formaldehyde and plywood and other wood products. And CARB stands for California Air and Resource Board. And that later became national standards, which we now have. And part of the reason it became that, Becky asked me to write the head of the EPA, I, th I forgot what they call her, the commissioner or something at the EPA, and also then President Obama, which I did, and I got letters back from them. It's in my file cabinet. Uh, 
And they did enact that, and I and other chemists, I'm sure, help and other people to get that. Now, what does that mean to you? One, uh, also through Becky, I met, I talked to a woman who did testing in homes, and she told me about this couple in California spent about $50,000 to have their kitchen redone. They're quite wealthy. One was a hockey player. One was a stewardess. And when they were home, they'd get sick. When they were on the road, they were fine. Turned out their cabinets, the wood came from China. And when they tested, that kitchen was totally saturated or had a high level of formaldehyde. And they have to rip it down. What this means is if you buy any kind of wood product, like cabinets, furniture, anything like that, make sure if it's not solid wood, and most of the things we buy are not, it's a veneer on top of plywood or particle board, that you test it for formaldehyde, especially if you know anybody who's got newborn children, generally somebody first child, let's go out and get all their furniture. Well, if it's not solid wood, it's made with particle board or plywood. If that wood comes from China, unfortunately, a lot of it does. Uh, even though we have laws, I'll tell you another story in a second, uh, you still should test it. How do you do that? All right, this is Becky's website uh, called Toxic Trailers. There's a picture of Becky. I've never made her, met her face to face. I talked to her on the phone along. And if you scroll down, all right, I passed it. All right. She, ah, here it is. Everybody see right here where it says test for formaldehyde? This company is accurate. How do I know that? Bush and the EPA tried to prove they weren't accurate. Test kit is $39. They send you this round sphere, like a disc. You put it in a room for 24 hours. They give you a mailer. You send it back to them. And within a couple of days, I forgot, within a week, they'll send you back either by US mail or email a report how much formaldehyde and is it high or not. And I've had students who have used them and they're quite good. And like I said, the EPA proved this company is accurate. Now, the other reason why I say if you buy it, one other story, a couple of years ago, there was this fabulous investigating reporting on 60 Minutes where uh, a company in the United States, uh, let's see, lumber liquidators were selling floors uh, wood floors, super cheap. A lot of their products are quite inexpensive. And 60 Minutes, how are they doing that? And a, a competitor found out and let 60 Minutes on to how to do a story. But anyways, they had their products made in China. And the boxes that were sent to the United States and sold here were stamped, meet the laws for formaldehyde. They didn't. 60 Minutes went to China, found that company I was making, and they pretended they were another company wanted this. And they asked them, what about the formaldehyde logs? Oh, don't worry about that. We'll just put, we pass it. And their products when 60 Minutes, tested the stuff that was actually sold in the United States. It was all beyond the level of the law and it could make people sick, and it did. And that's why anytime you buy any, a lot of things, furniture or new floor, I'd still test for it. And here's something my uh, promise to you. If you ever are unsure about something like that or forget where to find the testing equipment, contact Dr. White. You got my email and it has nothing to do with Chem 170 and I'll help you out. And that's formaldehyde. When used properly, and the free formaldehyde is very low, which is anything made in the United States, with the glue resin made from resin in the United States, it's going to be safe. But if it comes from China, who knows? It may or may not. All right.
Now, let's talk about, and the switch is off for here, let's talk about some aldehydes and ketones in nature. Now, we've already talked about benzaldehyde. Now, it was in the lab and you were asked to, don't forget, uh, Monday's lab is due today. Benzaldehyde, and I'll never ask that. Well, benzaldehyde is a com IUPAC name, and that's the aldehyde that's responsible for the flavor and taste of cherries and almonds. Now, cinnamon aldehyde is an aldehyde, and it's actually trans. And I'll never ask you to draw the structure, but it's interesting to learn about stuff. And cinnamon aldehyde has got actually three functional groups in it, an aldehyde, a benzene ring and a double bond. And this is responsible, guess what? For the taste and smell of cinnamon. Cinnamon aldehyde is a common name. I you pack, well, I'm not gonna go into it. Now, how many of you like vanilla extract? Dr. White's vanilla extract freak, I love it in anything. And, And you're going to have to wait a second because I always spell it wrong. And this is a structure of vanillin, which is a key ingredient in vanilla extract. You have a benzene ring, an aromatic compound, aldehyde, an ether here. Oh, you're learning all this stuff. You know it. And an alcohol hydroxyl group on the benzene ring. And this is the molecule that's the main component in vanilla extract, which comes from the vanilla bean. I love it. Oh, do I love it. And while we're here, let's do this because it's quicker. For those who like raspberries, which I do. And here's the structure of raspberry ketone. You notice right here, you have benzene ring with a hydrox group, ooh, an alcohol. And then you have CH2, remember just the line, every bend in the line is a carbon CH2, bicarbonyl, carbon, double bond oxygen. And right over here, you have a methyl group. And this is responsible for the taste and smell of raspberries. So you're learning about stuff in your everyday life. And this is a good time, I think. Let's take a, about a four and five minute break, come back at 1.45 and we'll continue. I'm gonna get you out early today. Thank you, Dr. White. So five minute break and I'll be right back because I can go stretch.
It's about five minutes. Let's get started. All right, everybody back. Give me a thumbs up if you're back and watching Dr. White. All right, thank you. All right, a uh, couple things I'd like to mention. First of all, we've already finished the alcohols problem set and the ethers and epoxide. Next Tuesday, I will go through the alcohol problem set. We're picking up speed, but that happens in even fall and spring. And next Thursday, I'll go through the ethers and epoxides problem set. Now, one thing I forgot to mention, on Monday in lecture, I will go through the answers for test number one. Uh, my tests have no multiple choice, so it's gonna take me a couple hours to grade everybody, like about four or five. And I got some stuff to do on Friday. So listen carefully. And I do this in the fall and spring too. I guarantee by 1 p.m. Sunday, one, I will have your test number one score in D2L. Also, by that time, or give or take an hour, I will send individually to each person an email with the points you got for each part, like 1A, B, C, or whatever, on test number one. I figured out, luckily, Dr. White's a power user, computer power user, how to do all that. On Monday, I will go through all the answers of test number one. And that's also a way to find out, did I make a mistake? Usually I don't, but once in a while I do, because last time I checked, I don't walk on water unless it's frozen, even then I stay off it. But I will cut that out of the video because I don't want those answers floating around the internet for the rest of the time, eternity. So if you can't make it to my class on Monday, come to my office hours. I'll be more than happy to show you the answers for any question on Test number one, the same will be for later tests. All right, it's lab time. And what's today's lab? Alcohols. Now, most of you are familiar with alcohol in gasoline or my favorite vodka or Canadian club, but that's ethanol. There are many other alcohols. And that's what we'll be doing today, investigating alcohols. And let me remind everybody, hydroxyl group on a carbon, alcohol. Now, as I mentioned before, I wrote all these labs. If we we're doing it face to face, you'd after I did my introduction now, you would go in the lab and do this stuff. Well, we're not, because Dr. White didn't want to go to uh, ECC with the pandemic in full blast. And still I'm a little concerned with the new variant going around. Hopefully I, even though I have all my vaccinations. So I was able to get permission to teach it the way I do online. And you're getting the same intellectual experience. It's not manipulating uh, chemicals. Now, Everybody see the alcohols lab on your screen? Maybe. Aren't you glad I, now do you see the alcohols lab? Thank you. All right, alcohols are flammable. Never use bunch burn in any organic lab. You never light a flame nowadays. Now the first part, we're gonna talk about solubility of alcohols in water. Now, as I mentioned, alcohols, because the difference in electronegativities of oxygen and hydrogen have a slight positive charge on hydrogen, slight, and this is delta means slight or little charge on oxygen. And if we have water, 
same thing happens. And you get, this is called the hydrogen bond. And from general chemistry, that's what makes the boiling point of water so high. Now, that helps in the solubility of alcohols sometimes. Now, one factor may be how large R is. I don't know. And that's what you're going to find out in today's lab. And how do you do this? If you were in a lab today, take small test tubes, put in DI. DI stands for deionized water. Is, that means we have filters at ECC and most labs do that take out ions from the water. And that's a better water to use for experiments. If you take a small test tube and fill it about a third with the DI water, then they add a small amount of the alcohol, then you mix it. Now I'm supposed to show you how, and I should. Let's assume this is a test tube. You fill it with some water, put in a small amount of your alcohol. There are two ways you should mix it. You should never ever mix a test tube this way because you're gonna get chemicals on yourself and maybe other people like the instructor, not good. There are two ways. One, hold the test tube. Remember this is a test tube with liquid in it, firmly in one hand, take the other hand, go one, two, three, four, five. Don't tickle it, really hit it, and that mixes it. Now, the other thing we have in the lab, which I also put out, and they're fun to use, are called vibro mixers. They're a box with a plate on top. When you push it down, it vibrates real quick. I mean, real quick, quicker than I can do my hand, and that mixes it, and they're fun to use. And what you'll do is you'll mix it, and then put it in a test tube and come back in a little while. And what you do is wait and then look at the test tube. And if you have one layer, it's homogeneous, it's soluble. If there are two layers, then it's insoluble. And when you're done, you put the waste, which has different alcohols plus the water in a waste bottle because the ECC chemistry department is a, uh, how should I say, we practice chemistry safely and don't pollute Lake Michigan or other places. We have special waste tr uh, treatment company that comes up and picks it and disposes of it properly. Now, here are the alcohols. Now, one thing I ask in a, one of these decades, I'll put it on there. For this table, underneath the name, draw the structure. for each of these. And you've learned nomenclature. Now I have isopropyl alcohol and that's a common name. And that would be two propanol. I give both the common and the IUPAC there. But anyways, I forgot. And because you're not going in, here I have the observation that you would have made. This is soluble ethylene glycol, isopropyl alcohol soluble, t-butyl alcohol or terbutyl soluble, two hexanol, one octanol, not soluble. Now, in the lab, one of the things I want to do with our labs is give people experience with the chemicals. And one of the important things is odor. And you'd smell it, put a little on a piece of paper, then properly go like this and smell it. And you put the waste paper in a container and we get properly disposed of it, not in the regular garbage. And if you were in there, students have come up with these types of descriptions or observations, and you will do that. All right, now let's go to the next part, part three. And this deals with oxidation of alcohols, which we talked about, and we'll be using potassium per, uh, 
uh, dichromate. And guess what? I've made a mistake here. Wherever it says, and I'll correct this and post it. This should be right here. Wherever it says muddy brown, and I was thinking of the wrong oxidizing agent, it should be blue or blue green. It's a beautiful color when you see it. Oh, that's not what I want. And I'll correct this later today or wherever you see this and purple should be orange. Oops. And again, these muddy brown should be blue or blue green. Now, let me explain what you're doing here. When you oxidize an alcohol, you're reacting an oxidation reagent. In this case, we'll use acidic, which means you put a little acid in there, sulfuric acid, to help the reaction go quicker. Potassium dichromate or sodium dichromate will do that. And let's talk about alcohols. I just remembered I forgot to teach you something interesting or talk about something interesting with this reaction. Well, actually, I usually talk about it now in the lab, so I didn't really forget. Here you have a primary alcohol, secondary tertiary. And when you oxidize it with potassium dichromate, this is a red orange color. When it oxidizes a alcohol primary, and I'll go over this again, because this is a way of making aldehydes, get an aldehyde plus when you oxidize this, this gets reduced and you get this chromium species, CR, plus three, I believe it is. And this is a blue or blue green, almost sometimes a turquoise color. And if you get this color changed, you know you've got a primary alcohol or with a secondary alcohol, same thing. potassium dichromate and with a secondary alcohol, you get a ketone and you'll get also the same blue color from the chromium plus three or blue green. Now, for a tertiary alcohol, no reaction, because tertiary alcohols can't be oxidized. And therefore, this stays red, orange. And this is a way of discriminating or determining primary, secondary, and tertiary alcohol. And you'll do the test. Now, what I forgot to talk about was this test plays a role 
in our everyday life. How? Well, let's look at this alcohol. And this is a primary alcohol. It can be oxidized to this aldehyde and you'll get a color change to blue green. And how does this play a role? Well, this is ethanol. And the DUI test that the police use where you blow into a device or blow into a balloon, they hook it up to the device, has strips of this material and the ethanol in your breath, they have done tests and they have a correlation for how much ethanol is in your breath and corresponding how much is in your blood. And they have a spectrophotometer, a way of measuring color, and they measure how much blue-green there is and that corresponds to how much ethanol alcohol in your breath, which corresponds to how much alcohol is in your blood. And they use this oxidation test to determine whether you should be arrested, more importantly, pulled off the road so you don't kill someone for driving under the influence. Uh, all right, someone just, can you see, uh, hold on. Somebody should have, uh, somebody should have, let's go through this again. I apologize if I missed that and I was so engrossed. Uh, you should just, hold on, let me see if it's the President of the United States. It's not, it's someone, a robocall. One more and my answer machine will pick it up. Uh, thank you. All right. Everybody, if I'm talking and you can't see what I'm doing on the whiteboard, unmute yourself and say, we can't see that. Because once in a while, Mr. Chat was lighting up and I apologize. Let's go through it again. Everybody's thumbs up, people. Do you see it? ROH on your screen? Thank you. All right. Let's go through this again. There are three types of alcohols, primary, secondary, tertiary. If you oxidize it with potassium dichromate, and in the class lecture, I just used this abbreviation, oxidizing, didn't talk about specific for alcohols. When this is oxidized to an aldehyde primary, you reduce this potassium dichromate to a chromium species that's blue or blue-green. It starts out red-orange. That's what that solution is. If you take a secondary alcohol and oxidize it, same thing happens. This gets oxidized now to a ketone, but you also make that same chromium, I believe it's plus three, and that's also blue-green. If you have a tertiary alcohol, oxidize it, they don't react, so you won't see a color change. It stays red-orange, which means no color change. And as I was mentioning a little while ago, before I was pointed out that, oops, I made a mistake, Ethanol, this reaction of oxidizing alcohols, ethanol and potassium dichromate is used in the DUI test for finding out if a person is inebriated. That's a fancy way of saying drunk. And the police use this. And when you blow into the vice, which I never have, I've only seen it on TV, but I know the chemistry involved because I'm an organic chemist, this gets oxidized to an aldehyde which reduces this and you see a color change. And they can measure wh what the color is and it corresponds to how much ethanol is in your breath, which they figured out how much ethanol is corresponding to your blood and whether or not you're above or below the legal limit. All right, so in this part, 
I've, like I said, this shouldn't be muddy brown and I'll make, I'll correct this and put out a new lab in the next hour or two and get that done. Now, the last part is a part that I do and you watch, and that's the reaction of alcohols with sodium metal. Now, this is a reaction and one of the rare times I balance chemical equation. Thumbs up, people. Did you see ROH and NA on your screen? Thank you. If you take any alcohol and react it with sodium metal, and what you get is a reaction, and that forms the alkoxide plus hydrogen gas which is given off as bubbles. And this alkoxide is a very strong base. And just a reminder, in case you forgot, the pH scale measures the hydrogen ion concentration. And if I were to put this in water, this reaction after I do it and put it in water and measure the pH. Above seven is basic. Below seven is acidic. And seven, just to remind you, is neutral. And if this is truly formed in a base, the pH should go up. And the demonstration I do is I take a beaker, put in some alcohol, I use 2-propanol, isopropyl alcohol, and take some of that, put it in water and measure the pH. Then I put in a small piece of sodium and wait a while and show the students, you can see bubbles forming, it's hydrogen. Uh, a very dangerous experiment, which ECC does let me do is you put some soap in there, take the bubbles, put it on your hand with a flint, touch it and it blows up and it doesn't burn you most of the time. At least I've never done it or it burned me and I don't do it anymore. But you see the bubbles and I take some of the solution afterward and put it in water and measure the pH. How do you measure the pH with pH paper? And I get one of the students to help prove what's the pH by the pH paper. And when we do it, the pH of 2-propanol, isopropyl alcohol and water is about 7. When you react it with sodium and put that mixture in water, the pH is now 13. And that's the experiment. And now down here, you'll see questions for different parts. And that's what you have to answer. And with that, I'm done. I apologize about the mistake using the wrong data for the wrong oxidizing agent. I had it for potassium permanganate the answers, even though I should have known that Dr. White for potassium dichromate. Remember later today, I'll be posting uh, the PDF password protected file for test number one. We'll have lecture tomorrow, and then you'll take test number one and get it up Friday. Don't forget the lab we did Monday is due today. It was a quick lab. Hopefully you all get it in soon. And I do have to apologize the last lab you handed in uh, on Monday, I've graded. I'll get those grades posted sometime today also. Yesterday, I got swamped with things coming up. And with that, I'm done. So I'll say, gang gesund, goodbye, and I'll see you tomorrow.